Hello, good morning, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can okay. hear you. All right. Thank you so much. I, I welcome you all to this. Um, another episode of our clinical presentation on the Young Ophthalmologist Forum. Today, we'll be discussing a very interesting topic to some that already have, already interested in such specialization and to all of us in as much as we are practicing ophthalmologists. So what we are discussing this morning is um, something very important in neuro ophthalmology, how to stay out of trouble, 20 golden rules, and which will be taken by one of our senior colleagues. We all know him, he's a vibrant ophthalmologist. He has mentored so many of us in person of Dr. Tomako Uchena, a senior registrar at University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, Gwagwalada Abuja. If you are welcome this morning, Thank you. Uh, so, Dan, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again and uh, to discuss a few things about um, um, neuro ophthalmology. Neuro ophthalmology is something I'm a bit uh, passionate about, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I keep uh, choosing topics that have to do with neuro ophthalmology whenever I have a discussion. I'm sorry I had to make you guys come out very early for this meeting, uh, but we'll just start right away. But the, the thing I want, the whole idea of this presentation is based on a book by one of my mentors. Um, it, was, it was the president of the Royal College of Ophthalmology, his immediate past president. He wrote a book, and this book is, a, this topic is the first chapter of that book. And I think every neuro ophthalmologist or every ophthalmologist needs to read this chapter at least. So I always like to share it uh, whenever I can about these rules and they're very straightforward, but we'll see as it goes that um, uh, how it is. So the idea of this first rule is that they're not really rules or they're just things that we should bear in mind when we see patients because it's always said there's a little bit of neuro in every patient. And if you are not aware, you may miss it. So beware of the silent neuro-ophthalmology patient. And a patient can have more than one diagnosis. And it's something that um, many of us may not actually um, be used to because in medicine, I think they always make us try to look for one diagnosis that explains all the patient's condition, at least where I trained, that's how we're taught. But as you get older in the profession, you realize that yes, sometimes one diagnosis cannot explain all the patient's symptoms and a patient can have more than one diagnosis. If you've been with us throughout our discussion, either ICA or part two discussions, you will see that I've always said that visual acuity alone does not tell the whole story. Remember in Kansky, they always say that you have visual function tests and those visual function tests are like five things um that you always have to pay attention to when you are looking at the optic nerve function and it's important we bear that in mind and you'll see as we discussed this morning that visual acuity alone is not a very good way of assessing a patient remember that you can have end-stage glaucoma visual acuity will be normal that's just one way of telling you that if we if the only way we examine the optic nerve in the clinic is visual acuity then we're not doing well enough. 
So they might, I hope I'll be able to convince you at the end of this meeting that visual acuity alone does not tell the whole story. So patients can have optic nerve brain tumors and can also have cataract. So you can have more than one thing. A patient can have cataract, can have glaucoma, and still have ptosis, you know. So it doesn't stop a patient from having more than one diagnosis. Just bear that in mind in your practice because it's important. Um, so let me talk about this case. So when I when I discuss a rule, I discuss a case to buttress the point so that I will not waste too much time. So you can have a mental picture of what we're talking about. 62-year-old patient referred to an ophthalmologist for treatment for cataracts. His, his visual acuity was 636 and 660. He had operable cataracts, obviously, 62 years old, so he had cerebral cataracts. But color vision was not assessed, and he didn't do a visual field. And the pupils were not checked. Remember the six Ps in cataract surgery evaluation? You have to check the six Ps, you know, and they're not really six Ps, but there are things that you should bear in mind. Starting from external, you have to cut the punctum, make sure there's no conjunctivitis, because you don't want the person to have end of termitis. And punctum means agnexia, intraocular pressure, and pupils, you know, just things that you should pay attention, you know, when you're examining the patient. And his vision did not improve after the cataract surgery, and they now had to now look for another cause. So be wary of evaluating a patient for cataract and not paying attention to pupillary reactivity because projection is very important. That is the other P you have to pay attention to. When you check the pupils, you have to project light in all four quadrants and ensure that the patient can see adequately or perceive adequately in all four, four quadrants. And if you do color the saturation, like using the cap of a, a pilocapine test or whatever, they, there's something like that, something like a test, that, not like a pilocapine test, but like the cover of a bottle or madrasi bottle with a red cover, you just want to check whether the patient can, you know, color the saturation is okay in both quadrants and in all hemifields. So the way you do confrontation visual field it would be nice to put your bottle and check all the four quadrants and see that the patient can perceive the colors equally in all four quadrants. It's nice, something, a quick way of assessing optic nerve function and also the uh, visual field grossly. So it's only when the patient did not improve, they now suspected that something else was going on. Then somebody now checked the pupils, found an RAPD, and the person had a pituitary tumor. And that was the real reason why the patient was having poor vision. Because if you look at 60 year old, 636 and left 660, you would think it's a cataract. And also be wary about when a patient uh, cataract cannot explain the degree of visual acuity loss. You know, so those are the things that this this case is about addressing. Final visual acuity became 636, and um, this would have gotten a better prognosis if the person had done surgery earlier. So they did an MRI, and this was the patient. And that's where the tumor was sitting. So it's important we remember that the puppy does not tell the whole story. You must look at other optic nerve functions. Color vision is essential. I'm, I'm amazed that we don't really routinely do color vision. We have it in our clinics, but we, out of speed, we're trying to rush. We don't do it, but please always do color vision in every patient you see to save you a lot of trouble in your afterwards, at least. Um, now, any new patient complaint of blurry vision should have the standard assessment, um, especially if the patient has a visual defect or vision loss. So it is, it's just a continuation of the first part where I was saying that there are five things the patient must do, want to have visual acuity, but we cannot always do the five things, but you know, it's important to make an attempt. If you see, I put plus or minus, because of the settings, I tried to modify the slides to suit in uh, local settings back home. And uh, it's important, standard visual acuity testing, you, you, there's no way you have to just try and do that. And if you think the patient's visual acuity is not uh, well assessed, you get a near card, uh, or they call, I think they call it a Kester bone card, uh, where you can actually estimate the visual acuity of the patient up close. So you do uh, color vision testing. I cannot, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. And the confrontation vision field test has two major ways of doing it. I do the, I do both of them, but some people would prefer to do one. So you can go quadrant from quad, each quadrant and ask the person to when they see your hand wiggling. That's like a dynamic confrontation vision field test. So you do it in all four quadrants. So you come from outside 
and come from this and come from under. Then you do numbers in each four quadrants. You raise your hand and say, how many fingers here? How many fingers here? So they see, so you can, they now do simultaneously. So you can, they can, you can know whether they are cheating. You put two hands and say, how much is the total number of fingers I'm raising up and how much, if you do it that way, then you have grossly assessed both static and dynamic computational visual field. And you've also assessed an important element of um, neuro-ophthalmic anatomy called like simultaneous, where a person can perceive two images simultaneously. You want to be sure that they're not just looking and you're not seeing their eyes moving. Um, then popular examination, swinging light is very important. Then if you can try and get perimetry on the day for every patient who complains of a visual field defect. Our people back home are poor historians. So, and our, in some places is the optometrists that do the perimetry. So it's hard to do this on the day, especially if um, the busy clinic and the, the patient is presenting late. So, but it will be important to have a whole picture with the perimetry and OCT when you see a patient. And if without these two, you cannot really assess the patient completely, but if you can't do it on the day they present, bring them back and do it. And this is very important. Any patient that has blurry vision should have these five tests. So let's see this 16 year old girl presented the ophthalmology department complaining of headaches. So she had blood vision in her right eye and flashing, like visual activity was six, six, normal intraocular examination, but she didn't do a fields. And they told that everything was due to migraines. So you see, that's the thing. We always think of malingering in every young person, 16 year old person, but be wary of that because sometimes you may miss important things that the patient may even have a serious problem. And until you do a VEP, it's not really fair to diagnose malingering. The only way you can diagnose malingering or functional vision loss is if you have actually tricked the patient um, or assessed the vision using optokinetic drum or done the prism test and the patient actually proves that they have good vision, please don't diagnose functional vision loss in teenagers. I know it's common people think that they are malingering, but please try not to do it all the time. Make sure you actually ver verify the visual status of each eye before you say somebody is malingering. So when it was re-examined, it revealed a right homonymous hemianopia. Someone can have a homonymous and hemianopia and have 6-5 vision. Every right one will be fine, but the visual field defect is something that if you're not used to assessing, you forget it because everything may be normal, but remember, if something is post-chiasmal, visual acuity can't be normal because pupillary fibers are spared, but visual field defect, respecting the vertical midline will be, will be obvious. And you see that you may miss significant pathology in the visual pathway. So this patient had a left clamic mass lesion, which was now diagnosed on MRI, and the real life patient had cryptococcal abscess because she had HIV. And uh, this was her fields. So you see that I'm just trying to stress things that get us out of trouble. And uh, these are things that we should pay attention to. So, so I, I'm, I'm trying to convince you that color vision is very important and visual field is very important. If you cannot do uh, Humphrey's visual field, please do confrontation. And whenever you can try to send a patient for a perimetry. The third rule is also very important. Now, this rule says that it's very tough to ascertain the cause of optic nerve dysfunction just by looking at the nerve or this alone. You know, if you look at an optic nerve head, I let somebody just look at do for those copy. You cannot really tell what the pathology is. I don't know how common this swelling is back home, but I'm just saying that if you look at an optic nerve, regardless of what the pathology is, you cannot tell if this normal disc is actually normal because you can have droboba optic neuritis. You can't tell if the person has papilledema or disc swelling, what the exact cause of the disc swelling is because there are many things that can cause disc swelling. I've just listed about eight of them. And they will all have this swelling. So sacral optic neuritis, infiltration by a lymphoma called infiltrative optic neuropathy. Then the common arteritic address clinic optic neuropathy, which is difficult to diagnose in Africa because we, we rarely have crowded discs, um, but it, it can have diagnosed it. And I think it's very possible. Papilledema and labor, which is something we also don't pay attention to when um, gentlemen come in with bilateral blindness. And we'll keep them for glaucoma. We don't think of levers. Uh, cat scratch disease, idiopathic optic neuritis, which is related to MS. And all the other optic neuritis, also all the other optic neuritis like NMO, SD, or MOG, what they call MOGAD. 
my among associated disorders. So optic nephritis meningiomas, they all they all will cause optic disc swelling. And it's important that we know that just looking at the optic nerve alone, phonoscopy alone is not enough. So you have to do careful history, examine the patient and do a field and try and so look at all these optic nerve heads. Um, I'm not sure you can tell the difference. And these are different pathologies, but they all look alike. And you see that the optic nerve heads are all looking the same, um, but you cannot really tell what they are. So the, all the things I mentioned, so sarcoid, these are, these are the patients here, eight of them. So you see that it's not easy to tell. Now, it is recommended that any patient who has acute optic nerve dysfunction should have a comprehensive neuro-ophthalmic exam. If somebody has sudden onset vision loss, just happens suddenly, regardless of what you're practicing, the person should have a thorough neurological examination because a neuro ophthalmic examination is what I'll, I'll discuss at the end of the discussion, just a brief summary of what it entails, but it's important you do that. And in a country that we don't really have too many neuro ophthalmologists, I would just recommend just knowing the basics, you know, of those five things I said, and doing a thorough eye exam, an optic nerve exam, you know, adding estrocular motility, saccades and pursuits. And that's really the cranial nerve exam of the seven or eight cranial nerves, and that will be fine. So if you can just do that quick bit, you've done a complete neuro exam. So let's look at um, this patient. So this, not all patients who are young have optic neuritis. So it's a two-year-old lady, uh, progressive vision loss in the right eye about three weeks. You will say, oh, three weeks, optic neuritis is a young girl. She's childbearing age, female, vision loss, unilateral, makes sense, pain and eye movement, RAPD, normal optic disc, bang. You think it's a optic neuritis. Was reassured because they expect that it will improve within two weeks and the person will get back to normal because that's what it always does. That's the cost. But three months later, the vision kept worsening. And the patient had an MRI. The patient had an MRI earlier, but they had an MRI later, and now realized that they showed a large nasal tumor compressing the right optic nerve. And the patient did not improve that removal of the tumor. In places where they sue people, this patient is likely to sue you because um, if you had done an MRI early, you might have picked up this lesion. So that's why it's important. You see that this patient um, had pain and eye movement, but didn't have a field. You can see the, the rules are, you know, you have to keep paying attention to those rules. And if you're always in doubt, just send for an MRI. Let it be at least you send for it. If it does not do it, then it's, you're not liable. But try and send for it. So, so if and talk about you may send a picture, the young girl, you send them and they may they be busy. Life may happen to them. They may travel or they may have a wedding and they won't come back for their appointment. So things can happen to people. You know, people can travel or, you know, the way Nigeria is not safe anymore, they may be riot in her area and she may not be able to come for the appointment. And you may miss her, may lose her, and she may be lost to follow up and may come back blind four or five months down. Line. So always just request everything you can from the beginning and don't assume patients don't have money. That's one thing mistake we make in Nigeria and we don't do the right thing. We think they don't have money. Just request what you think is right. Explain to them that it's expensive then list the order of priority and let them go home and decide what they want. So this is a patient, the patient had a very large nasal and beware of nasal masses because sometimes people can have sinus tumors, sinusitis, mucosal, and cause secondary infective optic neuritis. But we don't really diagnose it much because we're always paying attention to larger things. So if a patient has chronic sinusitis and has been blowing their nose for a long time or has had trauma, or epistasis in the past, maybe maybe a fracture their media wall, you, you'll be shocked, shocked that this patient always come down with. So anybody with previous history of facial trauma or head trauma that they had epistaxis, then has nasal symptoms, the patient may have infective optic neuritis just from sinus, sometimes from this contiguous spread from the sinuses, or it could be a mass. So don't, don't always think that the optic neuritis has to be all the big, big names like multiple sclerosis or, it can be just from contiguous structures um, just around there. So this is another patient. So, he, so two things that are very important in acute optic neuropathies. You have the ones that are acute in young people, acute in older people. So acute optic neuropathies in younger persons is, is multiple sclerosis. 
active fibromyalgia in slightly older people is NAIRN. So NAIRN is very interesting. It's like a stroke, but it's not really a stroke, and it's common in vascular parts. So a 55 year old lady, a man presented with progressive vision loss over seven days, uh, after like 86 to a right RAPD, then has the altitudinal field defect. So automatically it's important, this patient has already been diagnosed of NIRN, but you know, you wanna be sure this patient has NIRN, why? Because we wanna check the other eye for crowding, you have to check for risk factors, and it's really a diagnosis of exclusion because you have to be sure that the patient does not have any other thing. The fact that they have a, a, an autonomous field defect does not mean that they have any uh, they are, You have to try to not prototype people too much, try to get all the facts, but also keep your mind open and not be biased because the person is 60 year old or 55 year old and is hypertensive. Then if you have an optic neuropathy, then you must have an uh, In the exam, like MCQs, yes, that is the answer. But in real life situation, you may get into trouble if you don't, think outside the box and always check the other eye and make sure they don't have, they have all the things that will make a diagnosis make sense. Someone told me yesterday and said, if you, you must write important negatives and relevant positives so that if somebody reads your notes, the person will know that you were thinking about that thing and your note will save you in court. So 10 weeks later, this patient had poorer vision, became pale, they did um, chest x-ray and found the person had sarcoid, and the person that examined missed a lower eyelid conjunctiva granuloma. So you see that this person actually had sarcoid, but it looked at NIRN and it mimicked the NIRN, but it was sarcoid. But because the person didn't pay attention to the external, the person missed uh, it. So it looked swollen, looked like an NIRN, but the granuloma on the lower eyelid. So don't take things for granted. Any nodule you see on the lids, Check the iris for iris nodules, busaka nodules, cope nodules, you know, leash nodules. Always look at the iris. And uh, the Chiroma always says that, um, one of my partners in the world always says that it is criminal to see a patient in ophthalmology without using the state lab. No matter how, how in a hurry you are, you have to use the state lab. You have to use the lab. And that's why I think in foreign countries, they discarded indirect and they use 78 or 90 because it forces you to use the system and i think that's why they stop using it in, in there apart from the fact that it doesn't give you a good, good enough view but if you use a slit lamp with 90 days of day, you will not throw the patient away anyways you have to use the system so you have to learn to use the system so the fifth rule is somebody that has glaucoma and something is not adding up you know you have to check for other things uh, during our discussions, I've always mentioned that um, non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy is very important. We had several people working in Ogolada, several secretaries and technicians who we treated for glaucoma for many years. But when we now saw that, we now realized that they actually had pituitary adenoma. And at that time, it was too late. They had a compressive optic neuropathy, and they've been managed as normal attention glaucoma for a very long time. Normal tissue glaucoma is not common in people less than 50 years. If you're diagnosing normal tissue glaucoma in a person than 50 years, then it's not really, it's not really, 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 um, it's not really, really common. It's not like it can happen, but it's not common. So if an 80-year-old person changing glasses all the time, found that it was reducing pressures were like 2500, people can have ocular hypertension. Just remember that someone can have ocular hypertension and just have genuinely ocular hypertension and no other thing. So don't think that a patient can have a pituitary tumor and be an ocular hypertensive. So that pressure may throw you off. Now, secondly, primary open glaucoma in young people will present with very high pressures. So if you have borderline intraocular pressure, you're not likely to have primary open glaucoma in a 48 year old person because this person is black, 40 years, you don't expect the pressure to be like 25 or 29. It can happen, but it's not very common. So I'm just saying that just keep your mind open. And see when you do the fields and you don't see a field corresponding to the optic nerve head changes that you are seeing. You know, you have to remember what they teach us as the basics. You have to see the notch and the thinning corresponding to that area of the visual field and the visual field if it must correspond to the ophthalmic findings. If it does it, then you should worry. And this patient had a uh, supracellar meningioma and um, 
it, although the opting a bit very curved, and you can see the asymmetry, you can see the thinning, you can see the violation of the acid rule, you can see that in the installation of the vessels, you can see all the things that you can see in the glaucoma, but it doesn't have a tumor. You can see what I'm saying. So sometimes, but everything has to add up from the bowel data to the presenting symptoms to the age, everything has to add up. You just just use one to make a diagnosis. Now, uh, the other rule that is important is that before you say somebody has amblyopia, I don't think we diagnose amblyopia much, but amblyopia is very real. And the doctor, any one of my daughter always says that he was trained by in UCH and they always told them that um, you have to explain why a patient is not seeing 6'6". Six, 6'9 six. Six, is not normal vision. So if a patient has 6'9", then you cannot explain why the patient has Six does not is not saying six six. Then you have not done your job as an ophthalmologist. Your job is when the patient is leaving your table, you have explained beyond all reasonable doubt the reason why that patient's vision is not six six. So also for amblyopia, you have to explain why is amblyopia, and you've done for amblyopia is purely a type of exclusion. You must actually check everything. Uh, not everything is normal. Then the patient is not improving. The theater woman. Came to ophthalmologist that I left her explaining in. So she was she mentioned that I has been lazy, you know. She, she, she so so. I mean, if a person says because here in Nigeria, I don't think people always say that my eye is lazy or the lazy eye is not really a common diagnosis because pediatric ophthalmologists are actually growing every day. But here you see that people can't complain. The patient said that her left eye has always been a lazy eye. So the patient recorded the ophthalmologist recorded the left amblyopia as the cause of the blood vision because he's already been biased by the fact that the patient said that uh, there was a laser and he didn't check for RAPD. So you see, pupillary examination is very important because if you don't check the pupils, then you cannot you miss an RAPD. And if the room is too bright, you miss an RAPD. So you have to look for your rooms that are not well lit. You can turn on the lights and check the pupils because it's very important. And before you diagnose, and blood pain must check the pupil. So they, they, because of the crossing, the crossing also threw the patient uh, of the margin of balance. But eventually they found a better they had an aneurysm compressing the uh, optic, uh, causing an optic neuropathy and the six nerve pulse. Unfortunately, by this time, the left eye was already blind. So it's important that we don't just see the aneurysm right there compressing the optic nerve. So it's important that we, um, okay, okay. So, let me see. Sorry. Um, hold on. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to say. But my, my, my slide is hard to get. Hold on. Um, why is it hard to get now? Let me exit it. Okay. All right. Okay. So yeah, so that's what I just want to bring out. So the seventh rule is that, um, like I just said, like uh, as if I knew already, you have to be able to explain that the visual acuity of a patient is explained by the visible intraocular disease. If you, if you you have to be able to account for why the patient is having poor vision, and you have to be able to account. So you have to ask yourself: Is the level of vision explained by the le the cataract I'm seeing? Can it be explained by the cornea problem, keratoconus? Can it be explained by lenticular abnormalities? Can it be explained by optic abnormalities or retinal abnormalities or macular abnormalities? If not, something's happening with the optic nerve. That's just how to figure it out. If you think that the dry macular degeneration is not enough to cause the visual decline, then that person has something else going on at the optic nerve. So don't just see mottling at the macular, very mild dry AMD with the patient in, maybe the patient is 70 years old and you think the patient has uh, AMD and is dry, you're not seeing any wet AMD some signs of, you know, and you just assume that that visual acuity is from the AMD. I mean, you have to try and explain why. So if the patient has more than one, one of the following, you have to check. And up, view acuity, 
you know, with RAPD, color vision loss. That's why color vision is important to help you decipher because color vision goes early in optical pathologies, except glaucoma. Then visual field loss, you know. So I think this pallor, almost everybody has temporal pallor. If you look at people as they get older, they get temporal pallor. So don't be, you know, you have to be very careful with temporal pallor. And also, when people have had cataract surgery and they are stethoscopes, then they have that pallor that is just there sometimes, but it's just good to pay attention. So this patient has a his elderly patient and she has severe pathologies and it wasn't picked up because they assumed that it was from something in the anterior segment. Um, compressive optic neuropathies are very deceptive. This is rule number eight. They can present as glaucoma. They can present with autonomic field effect. They can present anything. They can be normal disc, swollen, pale, cupped. Unfortunately, we don't do uh, MRI frequently because of the cost, and it makes sense. But if you can just do a basic confrontational visual field, check the color vision, check the pupil, check motility, you are somehow home and dry, and always check facial sensation. I will explain the things and, and, and how to best way to look at it, but it's always good to check the sensation on the face roughly, V1, V2, V3, just touch their face and just ask them, does this touch feel equal on both sides? Does this touch feel equal on both sides? Then you touch the V3. If you can just do a facial exam and do corneal sensitivity with um, a whips of cutting wool, you, you will get a lot of compressive tumors. Um, so it's important to just do a quick cranial, ex cranial nerve exam, which I will summarize at the end. Um, but just bear in mind that some may have a cupped disc, but may not have glaucoma. Some may have a normal disc, but have a pituitary tumor. So don't always think that a patient with cup disc has glaucoma. So this patient has, so you can see the, 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 the image, see the uh, adenoma. So yeah, we can have any, we've discussed this briefly, and I said functional visual loss is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's important that you actually have to trick the patient into demonstrating that they have complete normal vision before you can say it's functional. Even if it's a teenager, even if it's a child, even if it's somebody you think that is pretending, Many people who have been diagnosed with functional visual loss end up suing the hospital because the child may have something that you don't know. And it's not even ethical to say functional visual loss without doing uh, electrodiagnostic studies. Because someone can have subtle RP or atypical RP or RP without pigment, you know, same pigmented. You know, you don't know what the patient has. So don't just assume. And you've not done VEP, you've not done uh, electrodiagnostic uh, diagnostic functional visual loss. Always be on the sister and say probable functional vision loss. You know, that way you're safer than just writing functional vision loss. Functional vision loss is actually a diagnosis of exclusion. So if a 33 year old man comes, everything is normal, but you didn't do an MRI, how do you know if he has, doesn't have posterior leukoencephalopathy? You wouldn't know. And if it's a post, if it's an uh, individual pathway behind, you can't know. So please, let's avoid. So this patient has his MRI. And imagine a country where you don't do MRIs. How do you know the patient has functional vision or when the patient actually has severe cerebral atrophy and affecting the visual cortex? And you won't be able to pick it because everything will be normal, isn't it? So rule 10 is um, papilledema. Anybody that has bilateral swollen this should have a CT scan with contrast. I know MRI is expensive, but CT and CTV is relatively cheaper. So they should just try and get a, a CT scan. I like National Institute for that because it's like the last SAMD usually, um, I don't know if it's still there, but same day CT MRI, you don't have to pay. You know, for any acute thing, you don't have to pay. You can do it and later you can come back and pay, or, you know, or just fill your form. And so, because same day CT for emergency, people don't pay, which is good because if you have papilledema, bilateral swelling, you have to do an MRI or a CT scan. And the patient don't, can't afford it, it's a pity. That's why we have to have that small clause to help people who can. I can't afford it to have it. So if the patient complains of come to the emergency room uh, with bilateral disc swelling, no other neurological signs, you, he, has, he may have a brain tumor. So his patient was found to have an astrocytoma. And this is this is this can see by bilateral papilledema. It's important that MRI is important. So now it, the other thing about MRI and MRV is that it helps you diagnose an important um, pathology called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. 
although this idiopathic hypertension is, uh, people have not agreed that the name is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Although it's called idiopathic, sometimes there are some things that can predispose or cause like a secondary form. I know it doesn't make sense to have a secondary idiopathic intracranial hypertension because idiopathic in the first place means there's no cause. But some people have now decided to call it primary pseudotumor cerebri and secondary pseudotumor cerebri. But people still generally agree that it's called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And the important thing here is that the person has signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure without any obvious mass causing the obstruction because we attribute raised intracranial pressure with masses or infection like meningitis. So if a patient has papilledema or raised intracranial pressure, vomiting and all this time, whooshing, ringing, projectile vomiting, all those things, and doesn't have any tumor, uh, and you, you follow the criteria, like six criteria for diagnosing idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which we'll discuss on a different date. Maybe on a different day, we'll just discuss idiopathic intracranial hypertension, you understand uh, the pathology. But the important thing is that you need to do an MRI and an MRV and CSF long path puncture to be able to, um, to diagnose this condition. Because if you do not do a, an MRI, you won't be able to diagnose this uh, clinical condition because the condition is uh, a condition that is diagnosed because of absence of neurological symptoms and signs apart from cranial F6 palsy and uh, exclusion of intracranial malignancy or tumor. So you have to do both of them. And the MRV is important because of a condition called venous sinus thrombosis, which is very similar to idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It just happens because of there is clotted in the venous sinus, either in the sagittal sinus or transverse sinuses, and now predisposed to raise intracranial pressure just from clotting of the venous circulation in the brain. Um, so if you don't rule out the venous circulation, you cannot tell when a person has a tumor, IIH, or venous sinus thrombosis. So if someone has Papilloma, especially a woman, it has to be three, one of these three things. It can be IIH, it can be venous sinus thrombosis, or it can be an intra, intracranial malignancy. So this, this patient is a 20 year old patient, and they found that the patient has idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but it was too late because by the time they checked, the patient actually had venous sinus thrombosis and not IIH. That's what they thought in the first, first time. So these the criteria. Is a long criteria, but I was thinking we'll discuss in a different day. But just for us to pick up this important is there will be no neurological symptoms, uh, horizontal diplopia, some patients will have cranial six palsy. As I said before, some things cause it like drugs, there's a claim vitamin A, you know, uh, apart from being obese, because most of them are usually obese, obese, obese women. But as I mentioned, you will see usually normal unless they have very severe status of life, for example, with five. They may have fluid, you know, compressing optic nerve. Like if you do the MRI, the optic nerve should be dilated. Or they may have, they will have severe optic nerve damage if it's very severe swelling. But they will have no other abnormalities. No blood pressure will be normal and every other thing will be normal. Visual field will show normal visual field or just enlarged blind spots. And the investigation has to be normal. The MRI has to be normal. MRV has to be normal. Has to be normal. The LP has to be normal when you do the CSF. Uh, studies. It's a different uh, topic on this and we'll, we'll hopefully discuss it some other time. Um, so now you cannot have spot diagnosis with strabismus. So if you look at the of the body has two arms, the afferent pathway and the efferent pathway. The afferent pathway is cranial F2, the efferent is cranial F3 and all the other muscles that move the uh, eye around. So you just have to bear in mind that there are two ways of looking at the eye vision problem and motility problems. They are the two things that the era of the world is all about. So these are just motility issues now. You cannot just look at the picture from the extraocular motility alone and know what the problem is. Even though you think it looks like a third cranial nerve palsy, you have to do take history to know what the problem is because thyroid disease, you know, patient can have myasthenia and mimic a third nerve palsy. You see, so you cannot really have a spot diagnosis with acquired strabismus. That's all the thing is saying. So if a patient has a right exo, you know, the patient is not adducting well, it can be caused by a number of things. It can be caused by an aneurysm, myasthenia, myositis, I know. So the, the important thing is that you don't take a history, examine the patient, 
and do motility tests. You cannot just look at the patient and say, oh, from the motility, I can tell what the diagnosis is. It's very hard to do that. Now, if a patient has unexplained diplopia, um, you know, you diplopia, especially if it's binocular diplopia, which means if you cover one eye, it becomes single. If you cover either eye, so you have to always ask them that if you cover either eye, it becomes single. With both eyes open, is double. So that's important. But it has binocular diplopia, whether it's horizontal or vertical, you have to investigate that patient and it, it requires a neuro-ophthalmic examination. Now, this is a very controversial area, but most neuro-ophthalmologists are able to design, design, this, this, the, determine who to investigate and who not to. But um, the patient with a partial cranial nerve free palsy, you have to send for an MRA. We've explained this before in many of our discussions, and I'm going to say it again. So what I'm saying is, one, if the patient has a partial cranial nerve free palsy, remember that the top cranial nerve, you have, to, when we've discussed that, and I, I think the last time I had a meeting with, about Bell's pulse, when someone has one cranial nerve palsy, you have to examine all the other cranial nerves to be sure that the person does not have multiple cranial nerve palsy. If you think about it that way, that's the gold rule in neuro-ophthalmology. So if someone has an optic neuropathy, you have to make sure that the other cranial nerves are normal because the cranial nerve two is a, the optic nerve, is, is a cranial nerve two, isn't it? So if someone has cranial nerve three, you want to be sure that the person does not have multiple cranial nerve pulses. I mean, the only way you can do that is to look at where are the three main places you can examine and begin to figure out where the problem is. So orbital apex, so third nerve palsy and poor vision is orbital apex or the problem otherwise. So you can see that you can use that to check for other cranial nerves. And third nerve palsy, uh, when it's partial and it doesn't happen suddenly, and it's not complete, maybe from an aneurysm, say posterior complicated artery aneurysm. So it's important that although we know ischemic optic neuropathy exists and ischemic uh, third nerve pulses exist, and those ones recover fully, you cannot really tell ischemic just by examination unless you're a very experienced neuro ophthalmologist. So the best thing is to just image everybody that has a third nerve pulse, just image them because you may not have the expertise to examine them. So the, my advice is just talk cranial nerve palsy, MR, and it happened in Wagula that one time, one, somebody requested MRI for a patient with a talk cranial nerve palsy where, when the patient actually needed MRA. So if the person will save money and did MRI and came back, I had to go and, tell, go and do an MRA because that's what you need. So the person will not pay twice. But if you just write MRA, the patient will save the person the trouble. So you see, good history taking is important. Another incident where a patient had an MRI, had tunnel palsy, but had poor vision, had a reverse RAPD, even though the puppy was dilated, they found a reverse RAPD. So that patient needs MRI of the orbit and not MRA. So you see that examining a patient can help you decide whether a patient needs an MRA or needs an MRI. Because if you don't take the history and don't examine properly, you waste the patient's money. So bear in mind that isolated optic nerve Third nerve palsy is MRA, where multiple cranial nerve palsy is MRI. So if a patient has multiple cranial nerve palsy, you have to first of all find out which of the nerves are involved and where, where you want to image. So just bear in mind that it's not all third nerve palsies require, you require MRA. If it's a third nerve palsy and it's isolated, then it's likely to be a positive communicative artery aneurysm. But if there's a multiple cranial nerve palsy, and there's poor vision, then it's MRA of the orbit, MRI of the orbit, sorry. But if it is multiple cranial nerve palsy and the vision is normal, then cavernal sinus MRI is what you should request. So you just for you to know what to do. So fourth nerve palsy um, requires an MRI, full stop. It's really nothing, um, you know, unless the patient has congenital force, which means you, you family album, you check that whether they had had a head posture for a long time, or you are hundred percent sure the person is ischemic uh, for because the person is vasculopathic, elderly person, never had any problem before sudden onset. So all ischemic problems happen suddenly, and they are complete from the beginning. So 
if somebody has an ischemic optic neuropathy, that's why it's a sudden vision loss, remember? So ischemic problems happen suddenly and the loss of function is total. So it's gonna happen completely. So if it's third nerve palsy and it's ischemic, the eye will be total, total, right? If it's fourth nerve palsy, it will be a total paralysis. If it's partial, that means something is irritating it or compressing the nerve, so it cannot be ischemic. So just remember that ischemic neuropathies are total and complete, and loss of function is maximum at the onset. So it starts suddenly, so wake up, and usually on waking up in the morning, like a stroke, wake up in the morning, notice it, bam, 100% dysfunction. But if the person said, hey, it was drooping small, small, oh, it drooped, in the morning was dripping small after two or three days, now completely closed. It means something was compressing the nerve until it finally got bad. So it cannot be ischemic or it usually will not be ischemic. Now, six nerve pulses, the same rule. Unless you are 100% sure that the person had an ischemic, which is the same thing I just said. Ischemic means sudden onset double vision or biological horizontal double vision, sudden onset, waking up in the morning and noticed it sudden, then you but if, if not, it's the person's in MRI. Now, GCA is a disease I will never forget because it put me into a lot of trouble. And um, you know, it's a disease I'm afraid of and I, I have many reasons to be afraid of it. Um, but if a patient, I don't know if GCA is common in Nigeria, but I think it should be if we are paying attention, but it's important that we pay attention to transient vision loss, transient, Visual loss, that is occasional blackout in the past. I don't know if we ask that in ice or transit double vision, uh, apart from the normal jaw collocation and everything we ask, but these are important things in GCA. You know, it's important to rule out GCA in every patient who is 70 or above. Um, so MRI is more superior to CT for many neurophthalmic examinations. So Although MRI is expensive, I always recommend MRI for patients. A normal CT does not exclude a serious disease. It's important that a patient knows that MRI is important and look for money because if you ask them to go and do CT, see the problem. CT is like 40,000 or 50,000. MRI is 80,000. So if you ask to do CT, the guy will do it stay at Comac and it's normal. They still ask to go and do MRI. The patient will now pay 130,000 for something they could have paid 80,000 for. So why not just explain to the MRI is expensive, then look for places that they do promo. So what I did when I was in, what that was to, that, that, like, I asked with some people in the X-ray department, radar department, can, I kind of like advocacy. So I advocate for poor people and I will sign on the form. If you are poor, I will say, please kindly give some con consideration. Or I'll take the form to the HOD myself. And I beg the HOD the radiology to please do this patient's test that they will pay later or they don't have the money, or they will pay half. And sometimes I will even add my money and join just to make sure the patient gets the, the appropriate scan done. So you have to have that kind of passion for your patient and don't request a test that will make them waste their money. It's very painful that they will do a CT scan and come back and in an MRI. So, but always an MRI without contrast is useless um, because. You, you, you will find out maybe one of these, I'll present something about it later. Some, some of the tumors do not enhance unless you put contrast, isn't it? So if you just do an MRI, it looks normal, but you're wasting the patient's 80, 100,000 naira without uh, being fair. So you, you need to put contrast. So the best way to order an MRI is to say, MRI head or brain and orbits with and without contrast or without, without gardenial contrast with fat suppression. So if you do that, you've covered all the possible pathologies that can occur in the model. So the second to the last rule is, there are many of the watch emergencies, some are life-threatening, some are side-threatening. So anything that has to do with double vision, don't take it for granted. Double vision is a, an emergency until proven otherwise because the bad, bad things that kill people, like a new reason, like a rupture, tumor in the brain, you know, myasthenia that can become bulbar and systemic and person will not breathe. Honor syndrome, uh, dissecting and reason. They are all double vision. So double vision should not be taken for granted. When somebody has double vision, I stand up on my seat and listen well because double vision is a serious problem. Then side-threatening problem like GCA, 
you must pay attention to GC and optic neuritis, then trauma and other things will be there. So the last rule is that the three common mistakes of ophthalmologists make that lead to permanent blindness and you know disability is that not suspecting that this patient may have some problem more than just the eye complaint. You know, you, you just, because you're in a hurry, actually uh, remember there's what they call last patient syndrome, last patient of the clinic. The last patient in the clinic, you are, you are in a hurry, there is no time, but they usually have big problem. If you notice, they usually have complex issues. And if you don't pay attention, you, they will put you into trouble. So always be aware of that, that last patient in the clinic where it just has minor eye complaint, but may have serious pathology behind. Not, not taking a good history and examining a patient. And I've explained that you must examine patients in neuroophthalmology in a certain way not to miss anything. And not referring, I mean, this doesn't really count in Nigeria because I don't know how many neurophthalmologists we have around. But if you have a neurophthalmologist set like in UCH or a Bado or like uh, or in Benin, you know, where you have or in UNTH, please do refer to neurophthalmologists. I'm sure there are many in other parts of the country, but I'm not sure where they are. But if you have any or have anybody who has interest in it, please do refer. Uh, these three mistakes cause much more harm, you know, than not knowing all the details. So if you just take this for granted, I think that's a major problem people have sometimes. They take this for granted and they assume that. But if you think about that, every patient may have a neuroophthalmic problem. There's an element of neuroophthalmology in every patient. That way you will not miss it. And um, in conclusion, to be safe, if you're unsure, just kindly refer. And if you if you text me, people do text me from time to time and I give them my opinion on, on patients. Um, feel free to text me or chat me or WhatsApp me and there. Uh, I can always give you my small uh, advice here and there that might help one or two of your patients. So um, well, I will just quickly run down the rule of topic exam before we can take questions, because I think there will be a lot of questions or whatever. Uh, but it's important that you start with the think about neuro of topic exam, the way we do in Nigeria, like we examine patients. It's always the visual acuity, yeah, and the near vision. but Think about it as cranial nerves. That's how the best way to think about the neuroophthalmology. Think about neuroophthalmology as cranial nerves. So you think about cranial nerve two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's how to examine a neuroophthalmic patient. So examine a neuroophthalmic patient as as um, as cranial nerves. Yeah. So from the two, the two stands for the eye and everything because the optic nerve examination is part of the cranial nerve two. Okay, and F2 starts with visual acuity, yeah? Then it involves color vision. Then we do the confrontation visual feature I've told you and color the saturation in the four quadrants and dynamic and static confrontation visual field, yeah? Then pupillary examination, yeah? Dilated frontal examination, retina exam and optic nerve examination, yeah? You've done the two, yeah? Then you move to three. Extraocular motility, three, four, and six are together, isn't it? So you examine extraocular motility, check for proptosis and ptosis because they're important. Papillary visual head, MRD1, MRD2, they're all important. And um, you now, after doing that, you've done the three, two, three, four, right? Now you go back and now check sensation for the fifth square nerve. You check V1, V2, V3. You say, does it feel equal on both sides? Does it feel equal on both sides? Does it feel equal on both sides? And take a rule of 41, check the color sensation, isn't it? So when you do that, you check the fifth cranial nerve. Then you do the seventh. Close your eyes tightly. Let me try and open it. It's not opening. Look up, forehead crease. Close your eyes shortly. Try and open it. Blow your cheek. Mm. Show me your teeth. Uh, smile. Mm. Chin, chin, shrug your shoulder. Latissima, seventh, isn't it? Then you make noise in your ear, make noise in your ear. Is this is it equal? Yes, eight. Done. So so once you do that, you've done a quick neuroatomic examination. And if you are if you if you are very good in neurology, you can just do power tone, muscle reflexes, reflexes, tendon, whatever, and that will be it. Um, if you do that every for every patient, you will likely not miss anything. So if we have questions, um, I'm happy to take questions. I hope um, I didn't take too much of your time. I'm trying to stick to one hour so that we don't stay more than one hour.
Okay. Thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to add when I was introducing him that Dr. Wanko is a neuro ophthalmologist. We have some, some great areas and I'm so happy. And I hope it's really going to change the way we approach our patients, even when we are not sure uh, they, are, they have neuro-ophthalmic complications or they have neuro-ophthalmic representation. So he has told us a lot. Color vision, as simple as it is, is a very important assessment that can help us to differentiate or to clear some of our differential diagnoses and to arrive at one or two, even before imaging is done. He has made us realize that extraocular muscle restriction, when it is noticed, does not really give you a diagnosis. You still have to go ahead and to be safe, do our neuroophthalmic examination. And most importantly, when we give out an MRI to patients, that really need to indicate what kind of MRI does that patient need. And some of those things that will add non contrast, fast suppression, I mean, we contrast with fast suppression, I really go a long way in helping us to arrive at a diagnosis. And I will not forget the fact that you mentioned something very important when, regarding um, young patients and non atheritic and stress ischemic optic neuropathy and older patients, uh, and also diagnosis of brain cell arthritis. I shouldn't think. You can't find it now recently at um, Asokoro District Hospital. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wako, for this beautiful presentation. I want to pause now. Somebody was raising her hand earlier. I think we have uh, one or two questions. Dr. Agnes Okoye, please, you can go ahead. OK. Thank you, Dr. Wako, for the wonderful presentation. It was really eye-opening. It really shows that it's a hero of thermology that took us on this lecture. So, but I have a few questions concerning, uh, uh, I, I mean, they are both about two or three. So my question is, why only test for cranial nerve 5 when you're suspecting compressive uh, tumor? And then the second question is, um, sorry? Give me a minute, okay. And in respect to MRA and MRI, why emphasize on hot cranial nerve for MRA? I didn't quite understand um, what you said about that. Then the final question is this. When you, you, you say something about uh, you can make a diagnosis of functional visual uh, the test without, uh, I think you said electro something. I didn't quite get that. And why is that? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, are, are we taking the questions at immediately, or at the, or everybody ask the question? I will take it. Or how do you guys want it? I think it's better everybody asks their question so that we can just take everything else together. What if I forget? Does any other person have any question? What if I forget the question? Let me write it down. Okay. Hold on. Oh, okay. So, Chief, you can go ahead. I can't see any hand up right now. Uh, let's just answer the question. Because, uh, thank you, Nenna, for your question. I mean, it just means you are listening, and uh, I'm happy that you're able to. Okay, Agnes, please. Yeah, so can you hear me? I think you can hear me. So, I'm trying to. So, the thing I was trying to say was the first part is that when you answering, uh, when you see a neuroophthalmic patient, the cranial nerve that is least examined is the fifth cranial nerve. And most of the time, if there is a compression and patient has double vision, it will be easy for you to see it when you do extraocular motility. But the fifth cranial nerve has a very interesting cause. And especially in the cavernous sinus, you know, remember that in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, you have the third cranial nerve, the fourth and V1 in lateral wall. So that's why V1 is very important in compressive lesions involving the cavernous sinus and the cellar region because the cellar region tumors always involve V1 sort of its cause. So V1 is used to pick compressive lesions in the midbrain 
and brain stem area and specialization. So it's important we do V1 and it's the least tested cranial nerve because not everybody remembers the cornea sensation. That's why I was just bringing it out that of all the cranial nerves that people are likely to miss and that um, is very inf affected in, because if a lesion doesn't cause raised intracranial pressure, the six may not be affected. See that all the other ones are like brainstem proper and they are not really, and their cause is, you know, not really compressed. If you, for, for something to compress the, the, the fourth nerve, it has to be those, are, isn't it? They have to compress the sixth nerve, it has to be very massive, red intracranial pressure, because that's why it's called force of the side. But if the fifth is subtle, I can pick very life threatening lesions in the cavernous sinus. That's why I was bringing that, um, that we are mentioning that. So it's, it's, it's not as if it is only in compressive lesions, or it's only the only glory cranial nerve involved in compressing the but because of this important location in the cavernous sinus, it will give you an idea and help you differentiate multiple cranial nerve pulses. Because if you have, if you if you look at the orbital apex, yeah, you know, if there's compression there, you have more of optic nerve vision function and third nerve palsy and fourth nerve palsy. But if you have fifth now being involved, it will shift your attention to the cavernous sinus area. That's all I'll just try to say there. Now, the other one I'll say about the MRI, let me explain it very well, because I know I was rushing and people may not have understood what I was saying, but because I've said it before, that's why I didn't want to go into details. So if you have a third cranial nerve palsy, you, you have to be sure. There are three things to be sure before you can diagnose third cranial nerve palsy. From the name, we already know most of them. Three or four things. But the first one is, is it partial or is it complete, isn't it? Which is properly involving or not properly involving. We all know that part. But the, the last parts are things that also mean, is it isolated or multiple? What it means is that if it's one of the third cranial nerve pulse, you must check the fourth cranial nerve and the second. Because checking the second and the fourth will help you know what imaging to request. For example, let me give you an example. If a patient has an orbital apex syndrome and has a third nerve palsy, right? Visual acuity will be affected. Now, the fourth nerve will be affected. So if you ask somebody to intox at the slit lamp, the person will not be able to intox. So you will know that it's not likely to be an aneurysm, right? Because although an aneurysm is a very common cause of isolated cranial three palsy, which is called, that is the posterior communicating artery aneurysm. Remember the circle of Lewis and the relationship of the third nerve, the posterior communicating artery. The posterior communicating artery is so close to the third nerve and that is the only place throughout its course where it is alone, and is running close to an, a, a, a many vessels in that area. So a posterior communicating artery aneurysm is life-threatening and mm -hmm. can compress the third nerve and can cause a pupil involved, involving third nerve palsy. So it's important that you do, you differentiate between these two because for a patient who has an isolated cranial nerve three palsy, what the patient needs is an MRA to pick up posterior communicating artery aneurysm. But the problem is the orbital apex. What the patient needs is an MRI of the orbit. Because if you do, remember the people will be made dilated, the people involving. So you need reverse RAPD to pick up that problem. Remember that if a people is, is dilated, the other people is normal. If you swing light, the normal pupil will dilate when you are shining light in the, in the mid dilated pupil. That was called reverse RAPD or RAPD in reverse. So that will tell you that there's an RAPD. So the presence of an RAPD and a third nerve palsy will change what you will request. You will not be requesting an MRA because it's not likely to be caused by an aneurysm. You'll be requesting an MRI of the orbit. Now, in the same vein, if you, if you, do, if you do cornea sensation and the person has reduced cornea sensation and V1 is reduced when you touch the skin, the upper forehead, yeah? And the person also has a fourth nerve palsy. Automatically, your MRI will be MRI of the cavernous sinus because 
it's only in the lateral wall of the carbonyl sinus you have the third nerve, the fourth nerve, and the V1. So knowing, examining the cranial nerves and picking these subtle symptoms or signs will help you know what to request. So that's what I was trying to say. And then I was rushing, I'm sorry about that, but I was just rushing to, because I didn't want us to stay more than one hour. Um, so MRA is only useful if you are sure the patient has an isolated cranial nerve three palsy, that is normal fourth nerve in torsion of the stadium is intact and visual acuity is intact and there's no RAPD. Two ways to check, put a pinhole in the, in the eye that has a third nerve palsy, raise the eyelid up and have them read, visual acuity is sixes. Check for reverse RAPD, normal. Check for color vision, normal. Do a visual field, normal. Yes, cranial nerve two, normal. In torsion at the slit lamp, normal. Isolated cranial nerve three palsy. But corner sensation has to also be checked. If V1 is normal, then you know it's not a cavernous sinus lesion. So that's all I was trying to say. What's her third question? Nena, what, did you, what was your third question? Sorry. Uh, it's, uh, that, uh, it's Agnes, sorry. My third okay. question was I wanted you to. You know, uh, you said you can't make a diagnosis. Yes, 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 yes. And then, yes, secondly, okay. sorry, before you go on, Dr. Wanko, I you said something about reverse RAPD. Please, when you finish your third question, can you? No, okay, I'll, 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 explain, I'll explain that. No problem. So let, let's let's talk about it. So what I was just trying to say is that there are many conditions. If you remember, I remember when I was in. Um, doing my part one, I remember they, they asked me to present something about doctor sees nothing, patient sees nothing. And I realized that when I started reading about it, there were over 20 pathologies that we don't notice that doctor sees nothing, patient sees nothing, starting from the cornea, like keratoconus. So keratoconus, keratoglobus, all those funny, funny cornea pathologies can happen, right? Then you can go on and on all the way backward, and you will see that. When you now get to the retina, they are, they are even newly diagnosed retinal lesions where there will be a problem with OCT in the middle part of the retina called PAM, for example. There's also some of the digits they call PAM affecting the mid and inner retina that the patient's photos will look normal. You think they are malingering, isn't it? Then also, ganglo, uh, retinal ganglion cell abnormality, photo cell abnormalities like retinitis dentosa can also have normal looking fundus. Remember the retina RP sync pigmented, right? So yes, sir. Yeah, so I was just saying that standard practice in places where things work, it is very, it's not, it's not fair to diagnose functional vision loss without sending a patient to at least have imaging, OCT, you know, and electro diagnosis studies like ERG and VEP. Because this ERG and VAP can pick things you, you and I cannot see with our eyes. So the safest thing to diagnose is to write probable, like this likely functional vision loss. However, we might require this, this, this to further confirm. You see my point? I'm not saying we cannot diagnose it. We can, but for you to diagnose it, you cannot diagnose functional vision loss just because of absence of pathology. You only diagnose it when you have proven that the patient's visual acuity is actually better than the patient is uh, assuming to have using OKN tests, prison tests, you understand my point? You have to, you have to visual or spiraling of the visual field. So mm -hmm. that's what I was just trying to say that it is not fair to diagnose uh, um, functional that without electrodiagnosis testing. Now, the next thing I want to say about the reverse RAPD is better demonstrated, but let me explain it to you in a very simple way. When you do a, when you do swinging light reflex, it's, unfor yes, it's unfortunate that we always focus on one eye at a time. But remember, as you are performing direct, consensual is also happening, isn't it? Yes, so yes, as I shine light in the ipsilateral eye, the light also, the contralateral eye is constricting, isn't it? But in a mm -hmm. third nerve palsy, 
with pupil involvement. The pupil that is on that affected side is me dilated mm -hmm. or dilated already. So mm -hmm. it will be difficult to check for pupillary constriction or, the, or dilatation in that eye that is dilated because the pupil is already me dilated. So you cannot mm -hmm. pick up an RAPD by looking at that eye itself. So the best place to look is look at the other eye when you are swinging the light. When you swing the light from the dilated pupil to the normal eye, once you come back to the dilated pupil to shine light, the other eye will show an RAPD. So let's okay. use the left eye. So if the left eye has the third nerve pulse people involving, and I shine light on the left eye, right? Mm -hmm. Then I go back to the right eye. By the time I take light off that right eye and I go back to the left eye, that right eye, which is a normal eye, pupil there will show me an RAPD by dilating based on the grade, depending on how bad the RAPD is. It can just, it can stagger a little bit then dilate or just dilate immediately. So when I see that RAPD on the contralateral eye, when I shone light back and forth, starting from the hips lateral affected cranial nerve 3 palsy eye, and the pupil in the contralateral eye is Hey, Dr. Wako, you can unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, ha, have I been talking to myself? Yes. For oh, dear. Just for it. No. All right. So, yeah, but uh, where did I stop? Where did I, uh, did I stop? You said when you were about to uh, swing the light. The light the no, a few light seconds. OK. Yeah, so 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 it, it's, it's better demonstrated. And uh, if you shine the light in the, the in the affected eye on the left, right, then you swing the light to the normal eye. Then you come back to that dilated pupil on the left. The pupil in the right eye, which is a normal pupil, will dilate. So if it shows that dilatation, which you normally see in an RAPD, it is just telling you that the function of the optic nerve in the other eye is normal. And the reason is because the amount of consensual stimulus coming from the, that left eye, which also has a third nerve palsy, is low. So that's why you will see that RAPD in the other eye, because the consensual light effect is weaker than the direct light reflex. So that's what well, will that happen. doesn't mean that the, the contralateral eye is affected in any way. No, it's no, just no, showing you no. the defect in the, in the equilateral no. eye. Yes, the contralateral eye is Thank normal, you. is normal. The dilatation you will see in the uh, contralateral eye is just a reflection of the weak optic nerve that is coexisting yes, with the third cranial nerve 3 palsy. So the Thank right you, eye is perfectly normal. Yes, perfectly normal. Thank yeah. you. All right. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does any other person have any questions? Time is fast. Sorry, we have tried it. Thank you for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any questions? Sorry, Any? Thank you for the Do we have any other questions? Yeah, somebody is speaking yet. Yes, yeah, go on. Sorry, we're speaking. Sorry, this is what I think I just explained where there's both a third nerve palsy and a maybe mild second nerve palsy. In the what where does it come in? Uh, where do you apply it? Where does it come in? And if you know that also you have both of that coexisting. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I was just saying that if somebody has a third nerve palsy, it's important to do this RAPD check because it will help you determine whether the person has an isolated cranial nerve 3 palsy or a multiple cranial nerve 3 palsy. And you also help you to know what investigation you're going to be ordering. Because if the person has an eye in that left eye, you know, remember the person may have complete ptosis, and you will, not be, you will not be too keen on checking that eye properly. 
But that ptosis you are seeing, that third nerve palsy, may actually be in the orbital apex. It may be an orbital apex compression from any tumor, it can be, can be tulosa haunt, it can be anything, it can be metastasis to the orbit, it could be just sarcoid, it could be TB. But if you quickly rush and write MRA for that patient, thinking the patient needs MRA to rule out a new rhythm, you've not confirmed that that third nerve palsy is isolated. So to determine if it's isolated or not, you need to check for the, for the first cranial nerve, 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 the second cranial nerve, nerve, and the fifth cranial nerve. So those nerves will help you determine where to report imaging to request. So if the second cranial nerve is affected, the only way to find out is one, you lift the left eyelid and, lift it and check visual acuity with pinhole. If with pinhole the visual acuity improves, then you know that patient's vision is good. Then you do this reverse RAPD and check for RAPD. If RAPD is not there, then you are happy. Then you also have to do a visual field test with pinhole and taping the lid to be sure that there is no problem in that left eye. There is no visual field defect. Because without that, you cannot tell is it is isolated cranial nerve pause. Then you ask the patient at the slit lamp to look towards the nose in torsion. If the eye can entort the slit lamp, then at least the fourth cranial nerve is normal. Then you check the cornea sensation and be sure that V1 is normal. If V1 is normal, then you have ruled out cavernous sinus involvement because a third cranial nerve palsy can occur at three major places commonly, but not all the time, but commonly. It can be isolated and uh, it will, every other thing will be normal, that is, Third cranial nerve palsy is present. Second nerve is normal. Fourth nerve is normal. Fifth nerve is normal. Location, posterior communicating artery aneurysm, skull base. However, if cranial nerve palsy is present and the second cranial nerve is affected, it's an RAPD or there's a visual field defect or poor visual acuity, and that I have to use pinhole to be sure it's not from blurring effects from the dilated pupil. You have to use pinhole. So and and V1 is affected, both V but uh, sorry and fourth nerve is affected, but V1 is normal, then orbital apex is likely. So the MRI you may request will be MRI of the orbit, and not MRI or, or MRA of you know you will be requesting MRA because you're not you're not isolated. But however, if V1 is affected and you have third cranial nerve affected, fourth and V1, but second nerve is normal. It is cavernous sinus onto proven otherwise. So there are three possible requests here. You can either request an MRA for acidic cranial nerve 3 palsy or an MRI of the orbit for orbital apex syndrome or an MRI of the cavernous sinus for picking up cavernous sinus lesions causing multiple cranial nerve palsy. So that's why it's important to examine the second, the fourth, and the fifth in a patient that has cranial nerve 3 palsy. Thank you very much for, All right. for, for yeah, this yeah. beautiful presentation and the, the way it took, I mean, you answered some of the questions raised. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you so much. I also want to appreciate Fatima Kari. She has been here and she has been making her own contributions, even though silently. She really appreciates this presentation. Ma, thank you for coming. Dr. Eze, are you around? Okay, so I think that will be all for today. Thank you all for joining in. And I hope it will impact. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Fatima Kerry, for, for okay. taking time to attend. Thank you, Mark, for, for And any other calls, other who is here present, all our chiefs. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, everyone. All, all right. right thank you. Okay, so we'll meet again next fortnight. Thank you. I guess we will be discussing thank another very interesting topic. Thank you mm -hmm. all for also joining in. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right, bye-bye. Thank you.